<laughs> then you should turn the lights on. And if I do this, <laughs> then there will be a signal to turn the lights off. Okay? <coughs> All right, I did this. <laughs> Oh, right. Column analysis. Steel columns. Last time, what was it? It seems so long ago. It wasn't Monday, was it? It must have been a week ago, Friday. Although we had to, re we had to re remaster the video <laughs> on, uh, I think we did do that Monday. Um, right. We talked about wood columns, right? Is that what we did? Maybe I should go back and look. What did we do? What was all this about? Okay. Yeah, this is wood. And you've probably even done a, a, an assignment on wood, right? And now you can do one on steel. Steel uh, is a little bit different. One, one of the things with steel, you're more, more likely to um, have a K other than one. That's one thing. Although uh, in a lot of instances, uh, the fixity is still taken as, at, and I'm not touching the table, is still taken as <laughs> pinned at the top and bottom. Uh, simple bolted connections uh, usually do not have enough uh, fixity that they'd really uh, prevent the, the um, member from twisting at the ends. Uh, you've got to think if, if you had uh, a column buckled how much, and the, it was a steel section, how much force it would take to twist that back, and that would be the, the moment that that uh, connection would have to carry. The bolts would have to carry that without slipping, because if the bolts in the connection slip just a little bit, <coughs> then, then the whole thing slips. It doesn't take very much to, to, I mean, you're not talking about huge deflections. It's only a small rotation, and usually there's enough slop uh, like a sixteenth of an inch or something in the bolted connection to allow the bolts to slip. So anyway, so unless you specifically design the connection to be rigid uh, or fixed, it's usually not. Like these, you, mm, this is kind of a lousy photograph because you can't see the connection. It's kind of hidden there. This was the that building on main campus that they, I don't think, I think it's already covered now, isn't it? Um, last time I looked. Uh, anyway, I have to get some better pictures of connections. So we're going to look at, at uh, analysis, all right, analysis and, and design uh, with steel, steel columns. Uh, analysis, of course, you've got the column given to you, the column size is given, and you're just going to uh, check the actual. There's a, the, the procedure that, that uh, Engel describes in the, in the textbook is, is more of a, um, mm, what would you call it, a, um, follows the Euler equation. It's more of a uh, pure theoretical approach to it, I suppose. The, the way it's actually done in, in, the, in steel design, there are a few more variables that you have to take into account, and the equations become a little bit more complex. But it's also usually done, um, it's simplified somewhat through the use of, of tables. And we'll look at that, we'll go through this first, kind of the theoretical approach, and then we'll, we'll um, look at the, some of the steel design tables um, afterwards. Uh, basically, uh, what you want to do in, in analysis is to see whether it's going to fail through, through buckling with the, the, the critical buckling load, or uh, whether it would fail uh, due to crushing, which must be this right here, if it yields first. It's either going to yield, when we, we mentioned the other day that uh, this equation, the curve of this equation is actually uh, continuous in both directions. It's asymptotic to both axes, so there's really no, no no upper limit to it. I mean, it would be a curve that would go like this. There's no upper limit to it, and there's really no uh, limit on the x-axis either. But physically, there are limits. Uh, physically, this, as this number gets larger and larger, that's the, the number that's plotted on the x-axis, 
uh, it becomes so slender that it's just it's like a piece of spaghetti. You couldn't possibly have it stand up. And really long before that, it's, it's, you can't use it to build with. If you, if you picked it up, I'm not going to touch your table here. You don't need to. But if I picked it up like this, and, it, and, it, and the real steel column was that floppy, if it was so slender that when you pick it up with a crane, it bends, eh, then that's not very practical uh, if it's too difficult to, to construct it with it. So those are, those are practical limits. And for uh, steel construction, for columns, that limit is 200. Uh, the KL over R, when that equals 200, then that's considered kind of the limit of what's practical for uh, use as a column. Uh, the other limit, Fy, this limit, is the yield strength. And you, can't, you cannot exceed the yield strength because the, the material would, would fail. That's where it starts to, to plastically deform. So even though, the, <clears throat> even though you may get higher numbers out of this equation, you can't really use them. So those are the two bounding uh, limits. Uh, so what you do is you calculate the slenderness ratios you're going to have two of them because there's a, a, an LX. Uh, this would be, this is the, in the X direction. Uh, if that, yeah, it's not very easy to tell. And this is in the Y direction, right? Coming off of this plate. That's the weak axis. This is the strong axis. So uh, you get, it could potentially buckle in either direction. With this column, it's obvious it can only really buckle in the weak axis because there's no intermediate bracing. If, there, if this piece of bracing came down and met it like at the half point, then, then that would be maybe ambiguous. It, it would have to buckle in an S about the, the weak axis, so the, the L for the weak axis would be, strong, would be lower, uh, and this would be lower, so you'd get a higher number, potentially than having this high and this high. You know, it's, you don't, if both of them are high and both of them are low, you don't know which one's really uh, uh, going to control. The largest of these two ratios, you do the x and the y, the largest of them is the most slender, the more slender, and it, it would control. So you take that, that slenderness ratio, you plug it in here. You, uh, well, first you check it against the limit. Okay, then you plug it into the Euler uh, buckling stress. You get the, the, critical, the critical buckling stress. <coughs> this, is, this has no factor of safety on it at all, so in, in uh, um, you have to put some sort of factor of safety on it. I think uh, the one that Engel uses is three, so I just kind of picked up on that. Uh, if you put something like that in there, then you get a safe um, or a usable uh, buckling stress. You can compare that to make sure that doesn't exceed the, the uh, yield stress. <coughs> and then, uh, the allowable is simply the lesser of, of these two, either you know, this one, which would be the, with the safety factor on it, or, or the yield uh, stress. And then you take that, whichever it is there, that becomes the allowable. That's this allowable. You, you plug that in uh, to this equation. This is just the P over A, so uh, uh, multiply the stress times the area, and that'll give you an allowable load. And that would then, that would represent an analysis, right? You've given a size, you've found what its capacity is, the capacity of that column. The other approach would be design, and that is, um, let's see, does it say design? Design. Huh. Oh, column length, I saw, saw it there, column. That, that's the length of the column is given. Okay, the support conditions, uh, material properties, and the load, and you have to find the section. You're trying to design the, the uh, size of the column. That's a design part of it. Here, this is the, this is the Euler equation. I've just taken, uh, I've solved hmm, the R and the A, which are both, whoops, where'd it go? Both in here. If you if you set this to P over A, bring the A over here, uh, get the R up here, you can solve for a term that is AR squared. And AR squared uh, happens, that quantity happens to equal the moment of, 
uh, oops, man, I'm not going to, the, the moment of inertia. So you can rewrite the equation uh, in terms of, of moment of inertia. This isn't real commonly done because you'll see when, when you do it with the actual steel uh, manual, this isn't really necessary. But, but to follow kind of using the Euler equation, this is about the only way you can do it because otherwise it's purely trial and error. You have nothing to target. So this allows you to um, plug in the load and the slenderness given a length, and this will be the constant for steel, tack on a safety factor, and you target a value of the cross-section, the moment of inertia. Then you can take that moment of inertia and, and find one out of a table that is at least equal to or maybe a little greater than that required moment of inertia. So that, that allows you to um, design it then, pick a section, pick a section based on that. Because otherwise, you don't have, if you just go to the property tables, what you've got in the back of, of the textbook, there's, there's no load associated with those. So you can only pick it based on, on uh, the, the moment of inertia. OK, so doing that, how do we do this? So use the other equation, right, to find, you solve for that, which is equal to that. You have to do it for both axes because this will be one number, this KL, you'll have a KLY and a KLX. So you actually do this twice, and you get an I, IX and an IY. Uh, you have to find them both, may, or find a section, find a section that satisfies both the IX and the IY um, in the table. And then satisfying it means equal to or greater than both of those values. Uh, then you check the slenderness ratio, make sure you don't exceed 200. Uh, calculate the Euler stress. Uh, so you put your, you've now picked a, a particular section. You would use that section and essentially analyze that section. You take those, those numbers, put them back into the Euler equation, um, calculate the, the Euler stress, put a safety factor on it so you get a kind of a safe Euler uh, buckling. Uh, then you check that against the limit. Like you, this is just from here down, it's just like the other procedure for analysis. Um, and then you can com calculate a allowable stress. So as an example, uh, we can look at this. This is one. And here, in a minute, we'll look at determining these Ks. But for right now, let me just kind of assume that they're given. Um, they, if it were, if it had, hmm, if if the um, frame were braced, then those numbers would be one or below. But if the frame is not braced, means you know that it it doesn't have like a diagonal. Oops, it doesn't have diagonal bracing like this this frame did here. Uh, and that diagonal bracing doesn't ne necessarily have to be in every, every bay, but it has to be somewhere in the floor. Somewhere to, if you have a rigid section in the building, then that braces additional sections that are kind of leaning up against it. Um, but assuming you don't have that, then it could potentially, you could have a, a K as high as 2. That was, would be the flagpole case that we looked at. Actually, you could have, an, if you had it pinned at the top and the bottom, and with side sway, you could have a K all the way to some incredible value because it would just fall over. All right, there would be no, no limit to that, to the because it wouldn't curve, wouldn't develop a curve, it would just flop over. As soon as you start fixing this, then this curve, it, then it would hold it up, and you'd if it were totally fixed here, you'd get the um, the mirror image curve top and bottom. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyway. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that with K in a minute, but this, that's the explanation for why K is over 1 here. Uh, then there are uh, these brace lengths. It's braced at the center, so half of 19 must be 9.5. So it's 9.5 on the weak axis, and then the full height is uh, 19 feet. Uh, we want to put a load on it of 65 uh, kips, and this is the design procedure. You want to design it. So 
we can go through this and then the, the analysis is kind of the same as the end of this. It's more or less the same. Uh, this is, is uh, A36 steel, which used to be pretty much the standard. I think that's probably most of the examples in, in Engel were done with A36 steel. In the last decade or so, A50 is probably more common because it's about the same price to produce the two of them and A50 being um, stronger, uh, that it's more commonly used now than the A36. So those, but those are the two choices. And that the E modulus for all steel is exactly the same, this number. Uh, the behavior of it as you, as you harden steel, um, it becomes, uh, the, it just goes further up that, that curve, the stress strain curve. So you'd go from 36, it would go higher up to 50 before it yielded. So this one's got a yield strength of, of 36. And we'll use a safe factor three. Okay, so step one. Want to determine these uh, two I's. We're going to design it. So we use this, this version of the buckling equation that solves for I. We plug in the different numbers. These were all the, the given uh, K that goes along with the 19 feet. This is a strong axis. You have to remember to convert the feet to inches because this is in inches, and you want the answer to come out in inches. Um, <clears throat> in this, si on this side, you've got the LY, which will be half the height, and a different K that goes along with that. And you remember to stick the safety factor on it. So this comes out to be these are the two I's. Now, from, from here, you'd go into, uh, with those two numbers, you could go into a table. Uh, you could just use the table in the back of the book. What's a little bit difficult there is that it's, it's not sorted by I. Uh, it's sorted by groups, I think, uh, of depth, like all the W8s and then the W10s and then the W12s. They're all together. Uh, on the problem on the uh, computer, I gave you the debt. I gave you what group it falls into. So then you can use the tables in the book. On this one, it's a little more general. I mean, this example, and I'll show you another table that um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Where do I get it? How come I don't have a mouse? Ah, he peers from nowhere. The mouse we don't want to end screen. Screen. Switch programs. Oh, this could work. Oh. Was it, oh, that was wrong. Oops, okay. Wait a minute. Let me do it again. I can do it right if I give it two chances. Everybody gets two chances, right? Okay. This one. Okay. All right. This is one of those tables. This one's sorted. I, I mean, it's just a, all the section modulus, or all the steel sections sorted by uh, moment of inertia. And on this table, the strong axis is sorted. And I think I've got another table that must be weak axis sorted. The, so the advantage of this is you can go down the list, right? If I'm trying to find the one that comes closest to, oh gosh, now I should have remembered that number. What was that number? A hundred and... 50, 140, something. let's say it's 140. I think I've got it highlighted on here anyway. Mm, ah, whoa. Hey, it must be this one. So by the strong axis, uh, okay, maybe I can power point. Ah, shoot. That's not right. Come on. It must be this one, right? There we go. Ah, okay. 144. No. 134, 134, these are the numbers I'm looking for, 134 and 12. Okay, now can I get back? Oh, man, this is really. Okay, 134, so I'd come down this list, these would all fail. 120, 129, I have to go bigger, equal to or bigger than 134. So this one would be, have adequate stiffness, it would not buckle, because that's why I'm looking, it's, that's why it's set up in terms of I. It's a matter of stiffness is, is going to control the buckling here. So that would, that would satisfy the strong axis. So that's one possibility, a 10 by 26. 
<coughs> you could also look at this. In fact, you'd have to look at this number. And that number would have to be bigger than 12, which it is. So that would be, that would be a possible winner. I couldn't go any lower than that in this table because this would fail. They both fail, in fact. So a 12 by 19 is not going to work. A 10 by 26, that would work. The other, other possibility that I might look at whoops, 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 would be sorted by y-axis. If I went down that list till I came to 12, here's the one that comes closest to the y-axis. Well, it's way over designed for the x-axis. So this doesn't look like this is actually going to make it uh, be better. But it would also be safe. It's safe. This one's failing, right? It's not got the uh, stiffness for the y-axis. This one passes. It's over 12. And it also passes here. It's greater than 144. So this one would also be OK, a 16 by 31. So those, must, those are these two that were picked out then. Yeah, 16 by 31. And here's the 10 by 26. Now, this second number, the first number, uh, the 10, is the nominal depth. Those are W10s. They're all about 10 inches deep. They're not exactly 10 inches deep, but they're about 10 inches nominally. And then there's a group of W8s. Uh, they're a group of W12s. They're a group of W16s, uh, 14s. You know, they're in, in size categories. Uh, the second number, oh, the W, by the way, stands for wide flange. Wide flange meaning it's that I shape but they're not the American standard eye, which was more of a, almost a cast, it's taken off of a cast shape originally, I think. Had kind of curved edges, fatter, shorter flanges. The, the W shapes were, uh, I'm not really certain when they first started using them, but it would have been early part of the last century still. I mean, like maybe the 30s or something, I don't know, or 40. I'm not so certain. I should look that up. That'd be very interesting. Um, anyway, but they are wider flanges. They were hot rolled uh, sections and are hot rolled. And, and the wider flange is more uh, efficient for, uh, particularly for column, also for beams because they're, they're more stable. They're less tendency to, to buckle out sideways. Uh, so there are advantages to them, and they're also uh, more constructible. You can bolt to them because the flange is flat. Those are wide flange. Used to have a symbol of WF, but then it was, in the computer age, reduced to mere W. So you could type it, because the WF doesn't look like it's typable somehow. Well, I didn't do that. Oh, shoot. Okay. Ah, this thing's, it's not a very good mouse, I guess. It's not a mouse at all. It's a, it's a finger. <laughs> it's not a very good finger. <laughs> okay, so, um, we'll use this one. Uh, so these are the, these are the two choices. These are the weights, right? That's what I was getting to. This one weighs less. You pay for it by the pound, so that's the, that's a more efficient one. So given, given uh, the selection here, both of these pass. They both are greater than these two values here. You have those two choices. This one's heavier. This one's lighter, so you do that. OK, so now you, you have you selected this section, so now basically you analyze it. And it better pass because <laughs> you uh, already kind of determined that it's going to pass. But it's a, sort of a nice check to go through all the, make sure it passes. It could fail this, I suppose. Um, make sure it passes a slenderness ratio. So you determine based on that section you check. Now you've got a real, an Rx that came from that section. Uh, you put that into the slenderness equation. You can calculate the slenderness. It's 80.7 strong axis, 98.1 weak axis. Oh, interesting. The weak axis actually controls. Uh, even though we picked it, that section based on the strong axis. But, I mean, the weak axis was also in there. It, in fact, I guess that's why this would be an interesting thing. You don't know that this controls until you do this um, with the actual section dimensions. Um, it's, both of them are less than 200, though. So that's, that's OK. Now you can go ahead and calculate the, the Euler, uh, critical Euler buckling stress. Uh, there's the straight Euler equation. You calculate that, 29 
um, KSI. Then you divide it by 3. This is enormous factor of safety. Pulls it down to 9.9. .9. That's certainly less than the, the um, um, yield stress, which was 36. This was 36. So this is, this is then actually the limiting stress, the allowable. So this is, this is the section to use. Uh, we could use that. We'd have, um, you can now calculate what the actual capacity, and the actual capacity you would expect to be slightly more than the design capacity. You designed it for 64, 65, wasn't it? It was 65, was what we targeted. But you're not going, because there are you know, only certain sections you can choose from, you choose one that's going to be stronger, right? It's a little bit stronger. So uh, this number, in the end, probably comes out a little bit bigger than this number, than the, your target value, which is OK. It's got a little bit extra capacity. It's 75, can carry 75.3 kips, supposedly. Um, rather than 65. So Bob's your uncle. What do you know? Now, we can look a little bit about um, how this is done with the steel, the steel code. And the first, the first thing we might look at is um, how, how you determine slenderness, uh, uh, the, uh, not slenderness, but the, uh, the K factor in steel. And yeah, now you can turn these lights on. We'll, um, I brought in here today both of my steel beams. I decided last night, in fact, I was thinking, I'm going to have to do something today with these steel beams, the rubber beams, because I got an uh, uh, email yesterday, actually kind of sad email, uh, but I knew it was coming anyway, so it wasn't that big of a surprise. The, the fellow that gave me these beams, the guy who taught me structures as an undergraduate, uh, when I graduated, uh, he gave me, actually a few years later, he gave me these beams. He said, Bulo, <laughs> I want to give you these beams. Maybe you can use them in life as I've used. <laughs> so I'm going to name this, this beam. I want to dedicate this Joseph W. Forty Memorial Rubber Beam. <laughs> because old Joe passed away. Uh, yesterday, either yesterday or the day before. Somebody called me and said, you know that guy died? <laughs> Joe, Joe died. So in memory of Joe, uh, we will look at the, his both rubber beam. He created these. He cre I just inherited him. He created this beam. He actually took a chunk of rubber and had it milled out. What insight. All right, so um, uh, let's see. In terms of... If, if this were totally free, you'd have a, a pinned at top and bottom. You'd have a, a, a K of 1, right? K would be 1. This is the kind of classic case. For that to happen, this has to be, this has to be fairly weak. I mean, if this was, was stiff and they were joined fairly stiff, stiffly, whoops, then then when you tried to rotate this, this would restrain it. But if this was, was very thin in relation to this, then this would just go ahead and twist. So this would, oop, maybe you should come up here. <laughs> so a little bit, a little bit heavy. All right, hold, hold it about, hold it about, well, just don't let it fall over. Okay, so if this, if this wants to, why don't you let it buckle? You pull it out like it's going to buckle. No, down oh. here. Okay, but don't let it slip at the top. If this just twisted, that would, that would be the K of 1. If it, if it didn't twist, if it were stiffer, this is stiffer, then it would, it would start to pull this back straight. If it were infinitely stiff, it would hold it rigidly straight. And then you'd get, and then you'd get the, the, if it was pinned at the bottom, the 0.7, or you'd get the 0.5 if they were both, both pinned. Thank you. All right, so that's what this chart's exploring. Oh, 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 and the other thing, wait a minute, don't turn the lights on yet is with side sway, if, um, if it's pinned top and bottom and there's nothing bracing it, imagine this is a frame. Mm. Whoa, okay. Okay, so if it's pinned top and bottom, the whole thing would just collapse, 
right? That would be that would be this with no side sway uninhibited, and these are the ratios relative. Uh, these are two columns. Uh, that what? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, top and bottom. This is top and bottom. Okay, and the, if the top was um, not braced at all, this is the not braced end, and this was not, I mean, you know, pinned and pinned, then you'd have an infinitely high K, though that would not be too good. If, if it were fixed at the bottom, okay, you still had side sway, but it were fixed at the bottom, this is and allowed to side sway, then this would be the flagpole case. And this would be, this is uh, totally uh, not, not fixed at the top, okay, pinned at the top. That would be, oh, golly. Okay, that would be, um, okay, this is the top, the free top, going to a totally uh, fixed base, and you'd pass right through that point. So you'd have a K of, of uh, 2.0. Mm. So what, what other, if, if, the, if you do have the bracing, if you do have the, cross bracing, then you're over in, in this chart, this is side sway inhibited, and you'd go from, uh, if you had pinned at both ends, this is pinned and pinned, then you'd have a K of 1. If you had pinned and fixed, then you'd go through 0.7. If you had fixed and fixed, then you'd go through, you're drawing a line across here, this is a nom nomograph, is what these are called, uh, you have, you'd have 0.5. So you can, and you can find, I mean, those are the, the, the classic values, right? But you can find any value in between based on, based on how rigidly connected this is. Whoops, I got the wrong here. Okay, whether it's really fixed or, or there's any degree in between, between totally free to, to rotate or totally fixed, what, what keeps this from rotating is really the relative stiffness of this thing because if this is weak, it'll just rotate with it, right? It has to, this has to have a, a stiffness in order to prevent this from rotating. So the, the stiffness, the stiff, and what determines the stiffness is a combination of the, the moment of inertia and its length. Uh, should be I over L, shouldn't it? Should be I over L. Yeah, oh, it is, I over L. So the ratios of the I over L of the column and the I over L of the girder is what gives you this, this value, and that's what you plug into over here. So this is what these numbers are, where these numbers are coming from, the relative stiffness of that connection. So you take the stiffness of the connection that's provided by, it, actually it's not really the stiffness of the connection, it's the stiffness of the members around the connection. It's assuming that the connection itself is, is totally uh, at the capacity of the members, uh, and, and that the only thing that's going to uh, be able to flex are the members themselves, the column and the girder. So, and you have, these are summations because you might have, you might have, uh, look at this, columns above columns, beams next to beams. So there could be, at one, at one joint, you could have uh, two columns and two beams, and then you'd have to sum the two, uh, the, the columns, that would be up here, and sum the two beams, and then you get a number, and then you plug that. So, this is where, this is why you, the, in practice, there is quite, for steel particularly, there's a, a range of, of Ks. So there's also the same thing with concrete. You'd go through exactly the same chart. In fact, the same chart is used for a concrete design, uh, and you have to determine the, it's a little bit more trouble to determine the uh, stiffness. But you do that, and, and you get a, um, a fixity for the concrete. For wood, it's not, it's not generally used because you can't, you can't get that degree of fixity generally um, without a big kind of bulky connection. It's usually case just taken as one for wood, and you better not have side sway. Okay, so that that now we can go yeah, yeah go back to that. So here's uh, just an illustration of this kind of bracing. I was trying to find uh, some picture. You can see here th these are simple connections, by the way. I should really look for a uh, one that. In f for to provide a, f the de a fixed connection that's able to transfer the full moment of the, the cross-section of the steel, it takes a good bit more 
uh, steel around it. You usually have a bracket welded there. You have a bracket welded up there. You usually have a stiffening plate in here. You have two stiffening plates in there. So the whole thing has a lot of little steel things welded around, and it's all fully welded then. That would be a typical fixed connection. This is obviously, and the build, what you look around in the building here are simple connections. And the simple connections do not uh, really transfer uh, the, the moment like that. So this would be a pinned connection. This is what you'd, uh, at least that right there, although it's continuous in this direction. So of course, it does have its stiffness in that direction. Uh, but it, yeah, all right. And then this is a different size. So you take these, these members, if it were fixed, and, and use those to determine the, the fixity, the K, rather, this uh, stiffness. OK, this is bracing. When you don't have that, uh, no, there would be no bracing against the, the side sway. This is the side lateral. And in a, in a couple of chapters, or did we do that last semester? Did we already do some, uh, those diagonal bracing? Oh, I could see these guys. I think we did. It was last semester, wasn't it? We looked at this exactly. We, we calculated right after we did trusses, because it's just kind of a uh, two-force member in there. And these are very obviously, look at that. It's just, it must be deliberate. Uh, they, they put it with one um, bolt there. That's kind of unusual that you connect things with one bolt uh, unless you're deliberately trying to reduce the um, um, moment, that you don't want to transfer a moment. So they must be deliberately trying to avoid putting a moment on this for some reason. I don't know why. OK, well, now when you design then, with, or no, let's see, this is analysis. We'll look at analysis with the steel then first. Um, there are equations that, that are behind this chart, but this is basically given a, a KL over R, what would be the, the stress? You can reduce it down to that since, um, right, you're looking for the, you're looking for the, the, the stress, the, the, this steel is for this table is constant. So I mean, the the uh, yield stress is taken as constant. It the table is cut off at a slenderness ratio of 200. So I mean, they put the values in here and they build into these equations the uh, the yield stress. So you can see at a certain level it kind of tapers off. Like here, it's changing. It's probably changing more rapidly. I don't know, five to four. Well, it doesn't look like. <laughs> it's almost the same, isn't it? Don't oh, make a liar out of me. But down, down here at this end, this this approaches. Uh, maybe I should say it that way. It approaches the the yield stress. Although the, here in the steel manual, of course, they put a, a safety factor on the yield stress as well. So this is the yield stress with a safety factor on it, basically, a little bit lower than the 36, and then. Down here, it it it'd merge in. It's a smooth transition in the curves, uh, the way they do it in the in the steel manual, rather than a uh, the way Engel describes it is kind of that yield stress limit. Uh, but what you do, you calculate the slenderness ratios. Okay, so you come up. Uh, hey, oh, what was ours? 134, right? 134. So maybe you'd come in here, or it was 130-something. Mm, no, it wasn't really 100. Whoa, that's not going to look very good. Only has it. Well, no, that was about right. It did. Oh, it's not too far off. Because I, I think we had, oh, it was 100. Yeah, I, hmm, it seems like it was 130-something. And this is coming out to be 8. I think it was 134. 8.3. 8 and actually, we ended up with 9.9. .9. So the, that 3. Safety factor of three is really pretty high. The steel manual uses uh, 27 over 12, I think. So what's that? It's more than two, but it's not much more than two. So they, the, in truth, the safety factor is a little lower than what Engel describes. Uh, so he got up to nine in that example we did, and, and a better value would, or accurate by the steel manual would be closer to. But you see, this is also simpler. Uh, you. You, you have to determine the controlling, I guess you, yeah, you do have to do both slenderness ratios. You take the one that's smaller, or, uh, larger rather, and you come in here and find. That gives you the uh, allowable, st 
stress directly, this is the allowable stress directly, then all you have to do is plug that stress into uh, the equation Fa to get P and boom, you could immediately have your capacity. So to get the capacity of the column, all you need to know is the slenderness ratio. You know the slender and the and the grade of steel. The grade of steel, the slenderness ratio, and you can immediately see what it what it carries. So that's pretty good. I mean, actually, you could probably do this. You should do this. You could take this table, go upstairs, look at that column that stands next to your desk, figure out. You have to measure it, figure out what what uh, what it is. Look it up in a table, see what the see what the R is. You know the height that's undoubtedly pin top and bottom, and you could see whether the roof might fall on your head. <laughs> you know what the capacity of the column is anyway. Then, you had, then you'd have to figure out the tributary area of the roof, and you'd have to figure out what the snow load is on it right now, and what, it, what if it got ice ponding. All right. So design. Design is also uh, a lot simpler the way the steel manual approaches it. Um, it also has, you can do this with equations, but it's, it's uh, a lot easier to do it with the tables because uh, the way that the steel manual just gives you basically the analysis equations, the Euler equations. And if you tried to design it with the equations, it would be more or less a, a trial and error process. The only way to effectively design it is to use the tables that are set up like this that you can go into and, and find members. So given a member, no, given a, a length, this is, yeah, and a load. Okay, so you're given a load, you want to pick a column. So what you'd have would be a number, like, I don't know, we could say 100 or some, some number. Oh, we had 60, what was it, 65? 65, except I forget the height. It was 19 feet, too. Yeah. Mm, but, but that's, okay, this is KL. So you'd have to multiply that by uh, K, which was like one and a half. So one and a half times 19 is what? Ooh, oh, sorry, but these are also, these numbers are all for the weak axis. These are all, these all assume that the weak axis would fail. So what was the weak axis? It controlled anyway, didn't it? Oh, it was half that, 9.5 times, oh, let's just say 19. I can't, I can't think of all these numbers. Um, so you, you have some height. You have to calculate the KL. This is KL for Y, for it assumes weak axis. Uh, and you come in here. Uh, maybe we had 19. Oh, that would be sweet. Look at that. It does come out to be, ah, oh, that's totally unrehearsed. Except this is a W8. Okay, a W8, this would be an, a W8 by 28. Uh, these are the weights. This is the size group here. So uh, this is an 8 by 28. This is an 8 by 24. This is 36 KSI. This is 50 KSI. So coming down 36 KSI, about 19. Well, let's see, this one, this one would fail. Wait a minute, okay, yeah, if we wanted 19 feet, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work at 19 feet. If we were only 18 feet high, we could have carried. If, if we really wanted to carry 65, we'd have to turn the page and go to a W10, which I think is what we ended up doing anyway, right? So you have to, what you do is you, uh, you come into this table with, a, with one of these numbers, you, a target number, and you find, you come down until you find your number that pass it. This would not, if, it, if the number was 65, this would fail. 69 would pass. So this one would work. It would work for that height. So that might not be high enough. So really, I guess you enter the table with the height, and you'd say, oh, that fails. And then you have to turn the page. You have to go through several pages. This is, they have a page for every single column. So this goes on for 10, 15 pages <clears throat> for all the columns. And you can then at least pick uh, and usually you have an idea of the size you want anyway, but you can see the, the capacity pretty immediately. Now, if the, if, the, hmm, if the strong axis is controlling, and this you'd know in advance because, would you know it in advance? Hmm. No, because you're picking, you'd no, you wouldn't know it in advance. You'd have to pick a column and then check the, the other axis, I guess. You pick it on the weak axis and then you check the strong axis maybe. You come back down here and look at this ratio uh, and you divide this, you divide the length by this, and that gives you the, the strong axis equivalent. So this is typical kind of code tables. They're very, com they're very dense in a sense. Uh, rather, that they could have made a whole other set of tables for strong axis, but 
but it would be the same tables you can convert from one to the other simply by uh, dividing the length by that number. So divide the length by that number, then you can come in and use the same table again. So it's, you, I guess what you can see from that is, on one hand, it's in actual practice, you, you are able to select uh, steel members much more readily. It's still based on the same uh, attributes. The slenderness ratio basically controls the, uh, the strength of it together with the, the uh, uh, ultimate strength, although that plays less of a role, right? I mean, look at this. From, to go from 36 KSI up to 50 KSI, you only get, in this case, from 87 to 88. So you wouldn't guess that from there, right? That's interesting to note. It depends where you are in the range. The lower down you get, see, look at this. And, oh, isn't that interesting? Because, because those, these ones at the low end of the range are definitely controlled by buckling. The ones at the high end of the range up here, this is only zero high. Oh, okay, six feet high. Uh, that's very short. That would be one that would be controlled by the, the yield stress probably. So there, the yield stress makes a difference. You know, 55 to 208, that's making a big difference because this, this is the yield stress, P over A. But where buckling controls, down it, it gets longer, right? Here, 27 feet, now it's 27 feet high. Well, then, then P over A doesn't make much difference. It's controlled by, completely by the buckling. And the buckling, think back to the buckling equation. Where was the buckling equation? Somewhere. Where's the buckling equation? No, 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 no. Well, no, yes. There's no, FY doesn't come into it. There's no FY. It doesn't matter whether FY is 36 or, 30 or 50. It doesn't matter. You still get the exact same uh, uh, critical, critical stress. Oh, my. That is interesting. Woo. What a terrific test question. Look at that. OK, so, so down here at this end, it doesn't matter which seal you use. So you kind of wonder, well, why, well, you can see why we stuck with 36 for a long time. There wasn't always, a, wasn't always an advantage of having higher strength steel. But, you know, OK. Well, end of the show. There you go. Have a good weekend.